everybody, so I wanted to, today we're going to learn about Chinese calligraphy and brush painting. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to our artist and our speaker today, um, Dr. Gonzalo T. Chow, M-D-F-A-C-R. So Dr. Chow is a 38-year-old Chinese American born and raised in the Philippines. 82, man. <laughs> 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 he immigrated to Indiana in 1966 to obtain postgraduate training in radiology at the IUNC. Except for a two year stint with the U.S. Army in Japan, he has lived in Indianapolis for over 50 years. He practiced radiology at St. Francis and Methodist Hospital and was program director of postgraduate education in radiology at Methodist for 21 years. He retired there as program director emeritus. He was the first director of imaging services of the new Clarion North Medical Center and retired in 2010. He also served as professor of clinical radiology of IU School of Medicine. Anticipating retirement in early 2010, he took a 12-hour lesson in Chinese brush painting and has been painting ever since. In retirement, he also takes up Tai Chi and founded a free clinic for Asians. As all amateurs studying Chinese paintings, he involves in the time-consuming process of copying from the masters. Hence, his paintings may be said to be after or in the style of a particular school or master. He donates his paintings to charity causes and asks a surprise gift to friends. So, please. Well, uh, we'll make this pretty informal, so if you have any questions, stop me. Uh, this lecture was something I prepared over 10 years ago and it's just been repeated. Uh, but tonight we make it a little of this version. We're going to start with calligraphy. In my version of calligraphy, is just the artistic way of writing, making it uh, beautiful. In the ancient times in China, to be a real gentleman, you have to know the six classics of ancient art. That means calligraphy and painting. Painting, there was no real painters in China. They were old scholars, calligraphy. But then when they get tired of calligraphy, they used their old used brushes and they started painting. That's how Chinese painting came about. They had to learn the ritual. They had to learn music. They had to play a uh, musical instrument. Archery. Everybody shoots. Uh, charity and board games. And so to be a real gentleman, you have to know all the six classics. And this is a uh, this is an old painting on the wall of how the ancients were practicing the ancient art. We started from how Chinese writings came about. Initially there are pictures of objects which represent concept, just like picture, like the sun, so a little circle with a dot in the center. Gradually, they make signs representing concepts. So, for example, good. The word good, there's a lady and there's a girl and a boy. Put together, it's good. <laughs> so that's concept, right? And the ancient scripts, even the modern scripts, they're useful throughout China. Even though they are pronounced differently, but when you write them out, Everybody understands each other. China has over 200 some dialects, but when everybody writes the same way, you, you can understand each other. So people with different dialects can understand and communicate through the same different languages. Now the earliest written language was probably 2000 year old BC, 2000 BC, the Shang Dynasty. At that time, the Neolithic ages, there was no paper, there was nothing invented yet. So the only thing they used was the, the scapula bone of the, of the oxen or the turtle shells. And these are symbols burned into, into the shells. 
So early seven, these are the symbols they're burning to. Later on, they even write out in the full sentences. And they call it oracle book, which is that when you, uh, like say, if you're a rich guy and you want to go hunting tomorrow, you go to the shaman and ask the shaman, am I going to have a good hunting? And the shaman would burn this thing on the turtle shells, and then he turns around and tells you whether you're going to have a good result of hunting uh, tomorrow. So we call it Chiamuya, that means Oracle Bone Writing. That's the earliest form of writing, 1600 to 1000 BC. There are pictures linked to concepts. They're using the blades of cows, shells of turtles, and inscribed with marks for the definition. It evolves a little bit into called the Greater Seal Script, and it's found in Erco Bones about 1000 to 700 BC. They are pictographs, they, they still look like the, the picture that, the, that you want to show. And then gradually, after the bones, when, the, when bronze was, uh, was uh, in the, indented, then they, they gave them the bronze. Now, if you look at the handout, uh, the last page of the handout, you can see that the first word is horse. The oracle bone writing is horse. It looked like a, with a head, with legs, and a tail. A couple of hundred years later, in the Bronze Age, it gets a little refined, and then later on it keep, keep being changed into the modern way of writing the word horse. This, like this word, it's like loyalty, it's, and it's a combination. It's a center, there's a heart. So it's center and the heart, it's loyalty. Now, it gets a little bit more refined. It's called Lesser Seal Script. It's about 700 BC to the present. And some of the calligraphers still print this. It started in Qin Dynasty. It's less, less pictograph, less picture, but it's more uh, defined and logographic. There are symbols, concepts. And in Qin Dynasty, with the Qin Emperor, at the time he uh, found out that China has all kinds of writings and all kinds of languages, the guy who built the Great Wall. So he wanted to unify writing. So he basically unified the Chinese writings at the time of Qin Dynasty. That's about 210 BC. Uh, he, he not only did that, but he also uh, made special uh, rules of how big a chariot should be, how wide the roads are. So he actually really codified a proper government, in spite of being such a cruel emperor. At about 500 BC, they started uh, unifying, and they, because of bookkeeping, they have to write down history, write down rules. So they become this clerical script. And you can see the clerical skip, this one and this one. This is called the clerical skip. Here the government started to document a lot of things, and they had to write them on bamboo strips. Paper was not invented. So, and they, they're made into scrolls. You can see some of the ancient movies, uh, that's, that's the writing of the Qin Dynasty, until about 100 years after uh, Christ, and actually one of my ancestors, Chai Lun, my Chinese pronunciation of Chua is Chai, so supposedly I'm going to take some credit for that, <laughs> <laughs> that he invented the paper. And next to that is the standard script, it's called Kaisu, between the Han Dynasty and the Three Kingdom and become mature in Tang Dynasty. That's about 500 years after Christ. The strokes are written slowly and carefully. You can see it's a really nice, each individual stroke has a purpose. The, the brush has a move in a certain way, and it's always like that. And this is a standardized way of writing. 
until today. When I went to school, that's what I learned in, 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 in grade school. The, the brush, you, you brush it down and you lift it up, the next stroke, do it, and then lift it up and another stroke. And it is the most easily widely recognized, and it is very neat if you look at individual words are really neatly written. And you can see even the, the stroke, the, the thickness, the waviness, everything has got some beauty in its movement, and it's neat and orderly. Now, people started playing around with this kaisu or standard script, and they, the next thing they will want to do is they do it, what they call running script. They want to increase the speed so they can write and make it a little freer. So it's called running script. In Western way, we call it the cursive form of the kaisu. If you notice, you see, the stroke is not stopped. It, you have one stroke and it, you pull it and another stroke. And so it's almost one whole character is one single stroke in different in, in different directions. And you can see that the words are not exactly block-like anymore. There's a lot of fluidity in, in the word. And it's, most people will write between this stroke, this way of stroke, and the, and the, uh, the previous one. This is for somebody who's a lot in a hurry. And sometimes two words can be connected. See, this, this word pulls down and connects with this word. This one, instead of five stroke, it becomes two stroke. One stroke, and it got up and just move on. And, and then the scholars thought, well, let's make it beautiful. So they go into cursive hand. You notice this. High dynasty, so this is about uh, 700 years. AC and pretty simple, irregular, sketchy, but very artistic. You can see sometimes the whole sentence, all the words are connected. So this is the modern calligraphy. And so many people become very interested in doing that, and people capitalize their entire career in calligraphy. So Calligraphy itself is the art of writing characters. So you write the characters, so you make them beautiful, but it takes a lot of discipline. And it expresses the feeling of the writer and defines the character integrity. It conveys the temperament of the writer. You know, he's happy, he's sad, he's angry. You can, people can detect that from calligraphy. And this is the wild Wild West of writing. <laughs> it's really wild. And I, with all these characters, I think I can, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there are ten characters. I think I only recognize six of them. <laughs> because the rest is just so fluid, I wouldn't know. My, my Mandarin, the number of characters that I know is fairly limited. I was not born in China, I was born in the Philippines. So, Chinese language is, is actually not my native language. <laughs> okay. The ancient says, in a scholar study, you have four treasures. You have the inkstick, inkstone, brushes, and the strand paper. And so I want to show you what the inkstick looks like. These are different colored inksticks. You can pass this one. This is an ink stone. You just drop a little water here and you grind the ink stone. And then you blow it with your brush. So grind your grind your ink stick here. The other is obviously the brushes. So these are the brushes. The brushes are for writing, usually are made of uh, hair from sheep, but for painting, some are from horses, some are from boxes. It depends on how you like your brush. Like for example, for for 
for horses manes and hairs you need stronger stronger uh, brushes you don't want too soft for painting flowers you want them soft for calligraphy you want this big calligraphy okay. and to complete the calligraphy the people you have to sign their name and so and then carve their name in the chat we call it chat and then the red mud put your chat so a calligraphy or a painting to be complete is it has to be signed by the writer or painter he signed his name and put his chat on okay but modern times we get lazy i don't write i just buy a bottle of ink <laughs> and you just drop it So, the Chinese script has been adopted, the Japanese language, writing, Korean, Vietnam, uh, adopted a lot of Chinese characters. This is a uh, Emperor Meiji Japanese era writing about, about Jugo, and all these characters are Chinese characters, from here to here. And, and then the, the other one at the bottom are Japanese characters. Japan initially thought that they could completely do away with Chinese characters and they invented their own. And they found that they couldn't do it. So they still keep the Chinese characters, except they pronounce it differently. And so is Korea. Korea invented many of the characters, but they should use a lot of Chinese characters pronounced differently. In Mongolia, Manchuria, and Yunnan, these are part of China now and Tibet. So many countries, many types of people adopted the Chinese script. So evolution. This is this is the word dragon during the Oracle uh, uh, during the the Oracle Bone era. The dragon with its head and neck, the front legs, the body and tail. The seal one is like this. And the clerical one looks like this. Then the standard one script is like this. This is the cursor, and this is the super fast cursor, shorthand. Now, like for example, human. Human, it looks like a person standing, bowing over with his arms up. Julie, that's the oracle bone human. As it gets a little better, during the Gary Seal, it's about the same, and then it changes. By the time it cleared up, this is human. This is what human. And you can see there's not a whole lot of, oh, sorry. There's not a lot of change between the clerkers, the Han Dynasty one, to the modern one. It's just a little bit better, but the cursor is a little different. Now, this is modern, this is the Mao, Mao Zedong invented this. He changed the Chinese characters, he simplified this. But let's go to the word woman. You see this is a woman, kneeling down, doing something. A rotary becomes like this. This is a lady with her skirts, her legs, two legs, and she was probably carrying something, you know. Her ear looks like an ear, and this is a modern way of writing ear. This is what I learned. I think what most most Kwan and, and many learn. And then this is the cursor, and this is the modern. Uh, Communist style, they call it Jensen. Even the fish looked like a fish before. And as, as a gravity, it changes a little bit. It doesn't look like a fish. But for us Chinese, we still think we know it's a fish. It's got four dots that's supposed to be water, and this is supposed to be a field. And this is a mountain, and that's the way mountain is written. The sun, circle, line, circle, and then a little bit more rigid, standardized, scholarly, and then more uh, artistic. So there are many famous Chinese calligraphers that I don't know about, just read about. Wang Si is one supposed to be the greatest Chinese calligrapher of history. And his is not the standard script, this is a little running script. 
he, you will, he, I know of him because he was not only a great uh, calligrapher, but he was also uh, a, uh, he was a high official in the Chinese government during the Republican days. I think he was uh, Minister of, 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 of Education. Yeah. And then Xian Yimbo. I always remember him with the long beard. And this is his, his calligraphy. One of these calligraphy sometimes spends in hundreds of thousands of dollars in the, in the London survey. And this is Xian Yimbo, running script. So that's my talk on calligraphy.